morning, everybody, again. Been a great day so far. I want to take just a few minutes with you and, and talk about living life on mission. Uh, before I do that, I just want to let you know that when I walk into my house today, I'm going to be wearing that crown. When they, when they asked if they could crown me, I thought, what? I've never been asked that before. And, uh, and the look in my kids and Amy's eyes, they were like, oh, no, what is this going to, you know, what does this mean? And, and then Pastor Doss said, you know, that doesn't mean, you know, it's not a crown like that. And I said, hold on. Shh, shh, shh. No, I, I think we should, uh, you know, we should build on this. And, and so maybe there's going to be a throne at home. You were working on the throne to make sure there was a place for me to, no, no, okay. So maybe, maybe taking that a little too far, but uh, so honored. Thank you so much. Thank you for, uh, they uh, uh, just to, to come this far and, and just to have the opportunity to partner this year in a new partnership and a new relationship. And then FCA, uh, just for a long time, you guys hear about them on a, on a regular basis. And uh, I'm excited about this new season uh, of what God's doing, a new season of fruitfulness. I was letting uh, Jay and Amy know that we just believe that this is the greatest season yet, the best is yet to come as far as LifeGate's partnership with FCA and how we just believe that in FCA, in mission trips, uh, with India, in all these different ways that God has called us to live on mission. Your job, your family, that every single day we can live on, on mission. And uh, we believe that the Great Commission wasn't something that was given to a group of people or a, 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 a just a special group of people. It was given to all of us that all of us are called to live on mission. And, and so um, you think about, okay, well, how, how do I do that? And I'm gonna kind of give you the end of the message before, uh, you know, at the beginning, but every life gator can be a part of the Great Commission by praying, giving, and going. Every one of us, praying, giving, and going. And, and so all of us can respond in that way. And you may, if you've been around a little while, you've heard us talk about pray, give, go, that we can participate in it in, in that way. And so <clears throat> mission isn't something we do, it's something we are. Being a missionary, you actually look in the Bible, the word missionary is never used because missionary is the language of believers, it's we live on mission everywhere we go. And, and so I know we have people that, that, that we would say, hey, this is a missionary because they go to, uh, you know, another country. Uh, some people think, well, then I can't be a missionary unless I have a passport. But do you know that when you go to school every day, you're a missionary? Because you're not from here. You're from there. And you have been sent here to be a part of a mission that God's called us to be a part of. And sometimes we can get so used to where we live or we can get so used to kind of what uh, the life that we're in, you know, the Bible talks so much about how we're supposed to stand out, not blend in, to live in a world, but not be of the world. And why is that? Why is that so important? Not just because we're holy and we're set apart to God, but because we're to live our lives on mission. I am so thankful that Jesus found me. Anybody in the house glad Jesus found you? I am so thankful. I was lost, but now I'm found. But now that I'm found, I'm supposed to live sent. God didn't create us to, to be saved and then to sit. And a lot of times we get saved and sit and we receive. But one of the things that we announced at the beginning of the year that this is a church of freedom. Anybody a part of a church of freedom? And it's not just freedom to me. Come on, help me finish it. It's freedom through me. It's not just something that God wants to do inside my heart, in my family, in my house. It's like living in this way that, that it's not enough for my kids to be found. What about the kids that aren't found yet? It's not enough for me to go to, go to church and, and or, or sorry, to go to work and okay, I'm found and I have a church, but what about the people that aren't here yet? What about the people that don't know Jesus yet? And when we're asked sometimes personally, even at FCA has asked us, hey, why? Why are you a part of FCA? Why do you go on mission to, to FCA? Why do you partner with things like that? Why, why are you the way you are? Anybody ever been asked that before? Why are you that way? And one of, one of the things that I, that I always tell them, and it's not cliche, it really is. What are we, we have to ask this question. We have to ask ourselves, and I believe the Lord asked us this question. What will we do about the people that don't know Jesus who will never come to our church? 
And, and I know we're building the church. We, I love this house. We just got done with a series of our hearts are in the house. But as an extension of my heart being a part of the local church, I have to, the question has to be on my mind and my heart every day as a believer. What will, what will we do about the people who may never come to our church who don't know Jesus yet? What will we do? And that's, I believe that question is core to living a life on mission to living a life on purpose, to living a life in the mission that he's called us. And so just, just real quickly over the next few minutes, there's a couple of things. I, I wanna, I, I'm just gonna help you remember the message today in, in uh, three words. Everybody repeat after me. Everyone, everywhere, everywhere. every day. Everywhere. That, that's a life, you don't have to repeat that. This is a life on mission. So everyone, everywhere, every day. Matthew 28, 18 through 19, this is the great commission. This is the great mission. So Jesus has beat death, hell, and the grave. And now these are some of his final words. And in your Bible over, it's probably got some bold letters. It's the great co-mission. This is where Jesus sends the disciples. They are found, but now they are sent. We are found people, but we are finding. We, we, we're not sitting. We are living our lives sent on the mission that he's called us to. And it says, Jesus says this, it says he came close to them and said, and I love that language. It says that he leaned in. You ever met a close talker? Somebody that leans in when they're, when they're saying something, and, and, and I don't mean that in a funny way. Jesus was leaning in for, because he, he really, he didn't want them to miss it. He leaned in, and then he said these words. He invited them to something so powerful. He says, all authority of the universe has been given to me. Now, wherever you go. So, all authority has been given to me. But now go in that authority. So wherever you go, make disciples of all nations. Do y'all know what all nations means? It means every single one of them. It means if you're breathing, you're a nation that he wants us to reach, to be discipled. He says, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. The great commission. I love the name of it because in the name, it tells you who we get to do it with. Ultimately, we get to do it with him but we also get to do it with each other. It takes you, it takes me, and it takes him. We can't do it without him. So it's not something that I'm called to do on my own. It's not something that's, that's uh, <clears throat> it's daunting in the sense that it's giant because it's bigger than me. But it's exciting in the sense that I can't do it alone. And man, there's this giant thing that I get to be a part of and give my life to by praying, giving, and going. But it's for all of us. There was a recent study from Barna that um, they do a lot of uh, interesting studies to help you see the state of the church, the state of the world. And one study that they said is that only um, that, that 51% of people that come to churches don't know what the Great Commission is. And then here's the question. If 51% of people who come to church don't know about the Great Commission, then how many of the 49% that do know it are living it? Like if it's not on our minds in such a way that, that impacts us, that, that changes us, that changes our worldview, that changes our perspective. If, if we're stuck compartmentalizing to say, okay, people like this or people like that, they're missionaries, but the rest of us watch it done. That's not the way it's accomplished. It's the great commission and what an honor and privilege that he could have picked any way to reach the world, but he chose to do it with us. He chose to give us the mission to give us the purpose. And, 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 and so that right there in itself is honored. I'm like, Jesus, thank you. Not, oh, it's another task to do, but man, what a purpose to live for. What a purpose to, to be a part of by praying, giving, and going. Every single one of us are called to be a part of the Great Commission. I want you to picture this. If one person were to stand on a platform and preach, Jay, preach because he loves preaching but if every single one of you if one person were to stand on a platform and preach for 365 days and a thousand people came to Jesus every night they preached let's do a little math on Sunday morning how many people is that good job that was pretty quick I didn't expect you to get so quick come, come, come so quick so 365,000 it would take 20,000 years to reach the world for Jesus 20,000 years, that's, that's a lot of years. But if one person reaches one person in a year 
And then those people continue to reach one other person in a year. In less than 50 years, the entire world would be reached for Jesus. So let me ask you, did God design it so that one person on the platform would reach many? Or did he design it where one person reaches one person? I mean, the math shows it the power of, of influence. And, and a couple of uh, weeks ago, we talked about the power of inviting, of coming and seeing. But there's this other side of living on mission. It's come and see, but it's also go and tell. And what are we telling people with our lives? Are we telling people about the mission that we're a part of? Are we living life in front of them and with them in such a way that doesn't say, hey, I go to church, but it says, I love Jesus. It's important to love the church. It's important to be a part of the church. But this is about him and what he is building and the greater mission that he's called us to be a part of. Think about that. One person in just a year. One year. And then that one person reaches another person. Man, in 20 years, the entire, that's a lot. That's billions and billions of people reached through one person. And God designed it in such a special way so every one of us could be a part of the Great, great Commission. And then it's not just everyone, it's everywhere. Well, just at church or just on the mission trip. You know, we spend all this work and you go and you spend seven days or 10 days on the mission field. Is that the only circle that God can reach people? No, not at all. Every single day we can live on mission. And in John chapter four, there's this, one of my favorite stories in the Bible, and I know I say that about every story, but this one for this moment is one of my favorites. John chapter four, the disciples get hungry and they go to lunch and Jesus says, I, I, I've got nourishment and I've got something going on that you guys don't know about. Now, let me just, just give you something. If Jesus says, I've got something that you don't know about, stick around because something really special is about to happen. But they're here in the growl. They're here in the, I mean, it's, they, they got hangry, you know, and, and like some of you, the way you're looking at me right now, you're already getting hungry. And, and so they, they head off to get lunch and Jesus had an appointment. He was headed back to Galilee, but he made a detour through a place called Samaria. He spent time with a woman and he spent time with a Samaritan, which was considered uh, not an outcast, but people were segregated at that time. Listen, it's funny to say this, but Jesus was ahead of his time because he was making a place for women and he was making a place for, for minority. Pretty powerful, speaks a lot to today and what our mission should be. But, but here's Jesus, he makes this appointment at the well and, and I don't wanna spend too much time on this, but he engages with her in such a way that he doesn't just speak to being thirsty or speak to the, the physical need, he speaks to the deeper need, the greater need that she had, the spiritual need. And, and then all of a sudden her eyes are open to see who Jesus really is. And it says that she finishes this conversation with Jesus, but she, does, see, see, she didn't just come and see Jesus at the well. Something happened when she had a moment with Jesus that created a movement in her heart that she couldn't be quiet about Jesus. She couldn't just settle it at the well. She had to go back to her village. Here's what I want you to know today. Every single one of you have a village. I know you came to church, but you're gonna go back to a village today. It's the house that you live in. It's the people that you work with. It's the family that you invite to eat turkey and some of them you don't like. It's the village. The village can expand. It's our community. It's our city. It's the, the realm of influence and the place that we exist. It's that job that you have. You go to work, but, but what if you saw your job not as a place that paid you? What if it was an opportunity God gave you to be on mission every day? And the benefit was the paycheck. But the greater benefit was the kingdom was extended because every single day you saw it as a place to live on mission. That we begin to see things that every single place that I go that I'm on mission. Students, if you didn't see, oh man, I've just got to pass math. What if you saw as helping a soul enter from darkness to light? And it was more than a, just a, about this accomplishments that, that won't be remembered in the long haul, but, but eternal consequences and eternal impact by just living your life, living for Jesus big in ninth grade. Living for Jesus big in a space and a time where the world would say they're not looking for Jesus, but they are. They're just looking for him in all the wrong places. They're looking for what Jesus can only provide. And it could be that listening ear. It could be that the, 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 the text. It could be the conversation. It could be something so simple just to be able to relate and connect. Jesus met the woman at the well giving her a drink of water, but he ended up 
building eternity and growing eternity because he met her just where she was and called her to this greater place. And I want to pick up the verse. It says that she runs back to the village and it says many of them, many of them believed all the people were listening. Now listen, her influence wasn't really that great because of her lifestyle and how she lived. And so she shouldn't have influence in a positive way, but Jesus, one moment with Jesus transformed her, but also created a platform for her to use for the extension of the kingdom. So many, so, so many times we think, well, one day, like after I've served Jesus long enough, then I'll be qualified to share about Jesus or I'll be qualified to share my story. But, but the great commission happens in such a beautiful way. It's the intersection of your story, somebody else's story, and God's story. And they all come together. And God turns a moment into a movement. And look what happens. It says, many Samaritans, this is verse 39. It says, many Samaritans from the village believed in Jesus because the woman had said. How many people in our village are coming and believing in Jesus because the woman or the man said? Because somebody saw their village as a platform to talk about Jesus, to talk about the goodness of God. And I wonder, did she present in this perfect theological way? In the beginning, God created. I mean, this was moments. Something inside of her had to come out. She had been with Jesus. Didn't say she had been to university. Didn't say she had a theological degree. Didn't say she was learned. She had just been with Jesus. Is there anybody in the house that's just been with Jesus so you got something to say? He's touched your life in such a way that it, that it doesn't matter if you have all the letters behind your name. It doesn't matter if you, if you do it this way or you do it that way. You've just been with Jesus and you got to tell somebody about it. One moment at the well, she was changed and she was touched. The moment. So what does it take to create a moment, I mean, a movement, a moment with Jesus? Something about Jesus. And, and, and so she has this moment with him and then she runs back and she tells everybody about Jesus, about her interaction. She actually says that he told me everything I ever did. Some of us would be running in shame. She was proud of it. He told me everything I did, y'all. It's the best day ever. I would be thinking, that's the worst day ever. But there's no shame. He told me everything I did. When they came out to see him, they begged him to stay in their village. Watch this. There's so much here, y'all. Because she said, they begged Jesus to stay. Not she made a place for Jesus. No, 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 no. Just because of the way she talked about how incredible Jesus was, they made a place and they said, you can't leave, you gotta stay. And he ended up staying for several days. Can you imagine the, mo the, 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 the disciples? They come back full, but they're like, what in the world happened? We leave for an hour and revival breaks out. And one of the most, one of my, this really is, one of my favorite statements in the Bible it says, a long, uh, uh, long enough for many more to hear his message. So he stayed several days. It says, they said to the woman, now we believe not just because of what you told us, but because we have heard him ourselves. They had a personal encounter. Now, who set it up? Who did God use to set? What was the mission? God used the everywhere of the woman to set up the platform, but now they with their own ears and their own eyes and their own hearts were able to receive this personal encounter with Jesus because the woman set it up. Wow, this is incredible. Then it says, now we know that he is indeed the savior of the entire world. The entire world, everyone, everywhere, and then every day. Romans 12, one through two. Paul spends the first part of Romans talking about it's by faith we're saved. It's Jesus, it's Jesus, it's Jesus. That's what he does. He spends the first 11 chapters of Romans saying, hey, we would not be here had it not been for Jesus. But then he uses the second half of Romans talking about, so what? So Jesus came, 
But how does that reflect it in the way we live our lives? And, and he says this, he says, in light of all of this, and what he's talking about is all the chapters before. He says, in light of his mercy, we're supposed to live in such th this way. I wanna read the message paraphrase. He says, so here's what I want you to do. God helping you take your everyday ordinary life you're sleeping, you're eating, you're going to work and you're walking around life and I want you to place it before God as an offering. He says that this is, this is the reasonable sacrifice, that, that because of his mercy, that because of what he's done, I want you to be a living sacrifice. Now, now we understand sacrifice is something that's, that's dead, you know, that's, that's, that's actually uh, slaughtered before the Lord. Now, he, he's not saying that. He's saying, I want you to picture it in such a way that you're not living for you anymore, you're living for him. And that to take your everyday ordinary life, what does God do with an ordinary life? He makes it extraordinary. God takes your regular going to school, going to life, or going through life day, your family, the trials, the ups and the downs, the things that you have to push through, the things that you're excited about, the things that the disappointments, God will take all of that. If we'll leave it before him as a living sacrifice, he will use it to bring glory and honor to him. Your everyday, ordinary life. Just, just going to work, just going to school, just doing chores, just going through sports working on your education, working on your degree, whatever it may be, retirement, every season of your life, transitions, all these different things, when we put it in the hand of God. Now, he's not just gonna take it from you. It's our act of worship to present it before the Lord and say, God, I want my every day to bring honor to you. God, would you just use every day to live on me. God, would you just take everything I'm in? So, some of you right now are facing some stuff and the, 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 it, 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 it seems like it's logical sense that when I get through this, then I'll live on mission. But what if that's not the point? What if part of what you're going through right now, the bigger picture is that God's got you on mission? We're thinking that it's gonna come in a, in, a, in a time, well, when I get through this disease or when I get this done or when I'm retired or when I have more time. What if we took the space and the time that God gave us right now today and we said, God, I present it to you as an offering. Use it however you want to. Would you use it to grow your kingdom? Would you use it to be an extension of your kingdom? Whatever that looks like. Can I see my control freaks in the room? Come on, tell the truth and shame the devil. Here's what we do. We say, when I've got my brain wrapped around this, then I'll do it. When he gives me all the pieces, when, when, I've, got, when I've got everything in the right box with the labels on it. And we say, if, then. And we kind of give this thing to God, like, God, if you'll do this, then I'll live on mission. That's not what it's about. Did Jesus just wait for all the things to just be in the perfect place? No, 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 no. He just laid his life down and said, man, there's a bigger purpose that we're a part of. And I just wanna help you see today, I believe God wants to help you see today that, that every one of us, that everywhere you live and that every day you have is an opportunity God has invited you to be a part of the Great Commission. In whatever you do, to pray, to give, to go. In 1 Peter, you know, Peter, we always like talking about him around LifeGate. He just gives us hope and encouragement because he was such a mess. But Peter had a revelation. He spent some time with Jesus and it changed him and it shaped him. And God used him to be a rock that, that was the foundation for the church. And, and he says something so profound to me. And I think it speaks not just in general about mission, but it speaks about today. First Peter four, verse seven, he says, the end of all things are near. Now, I just want you to think about this. Pastor Dawson and I were talking about it on the way to church this morning. This was, this was hundreds and hundreds of years ago, and he was saying that the time for Jesus' return was near. How much closer are we now than Peter? But he says to live your lives in such a way. Now, let's see what he says behind it. The end is near. He goes, therefore, be alert and sober-minded 
You know what he's saying? He's not saying, you know, don't be drunk with alcohol. That, that's important. But he's saying being sober-minded, don't be drunk with the culture that you're, you have fallen asleep at the wheel. Don't be asleep to the mission that God's given us. And then he goes on. I mean, it's very simple. I love the simple instruction of the word. He says, he says be of sober-minded so that you would pray. Everybody say pray. Above all, love each other deeply because love covers a multitude of sins. Offer hospitality to one another without grumbling. Each of you should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. If any one of you speaks, then you should do so. Speak the very words of God. If anyone serves, they should do so with strength that God provides so that in all things... God may be praised through Jesus Christ. To him be the glory, the power forever and ever. Amen. So so in light of his mercies and in light of that the end is near, we got to live on mission today like never before. We got to live on mission. We got to live on purpose. We've given practical ways to, to, to do that, to partner with FCA in a personal way. We already do this as a church. Part of your giving already goes, but in a personal way to do that. In in India and the other mission trips, you're going to have, there are opportunities, but but I want you today, I I want us to do something together collectively as a response. We're going to pray. We're going to pray for the lost and the hurting. We're going to pray for the kids in our city that don't know Jesus, the coaches, the teachers. We're going to pray for the world. We're going to pray for India. We're going to pray for the 1040 window. We're going to pray for the, the 4 through 14 window. We're going, to, we're going to stand before the Lord. And some of us think of this as, as, well, we'll just pray. Prayer is the most powerful thing you can do before the throne of God. And remember what Jesus said. He said, all authority has been given unto me, therefore go. I want you to think about praying, giving, and going in the authority of Jesus. How would Jesus pray? How would Jesus give? And how would Jesus go? That's how he wants us to live our lives, praying, giving, and going. So we're going to pray. And then, and then giving, you already do that. But you know, when you give your time, your talent, and your resources, wow, you just give what God put in your hand, your space. I love what Amy said. She goes, whatever time you got, God will use it to give your time, your talent, and your resources. And I love Jesus's model. He sacrificed, I know it wasn't a giant deal to Jesus, but it's a lesson. He sacrificed a meal to have a moment with a woman that created a movement. What sacrifice are you experiencing in your life so that the mission will move forward? It's not about the amount. It's about the sacrifice. Are you living your life Sacrifice so that others who have not heard will know. And that not just so that they'll hear, but they'll be discipled and grow. To give your lives, to pray, to give, and then to go. Y'all know what go means? It means go. Go today. Go to work tomorrow. Go to school tomorrow. Go to school. Go to the ball field. Go to the grocery store. Go to an FCA huddle. Go to India, go to your neighborhood, go just to live your lives sent. I'm saved, but I'm sent. Every believer can be a part of the Great Commission, praying, giving, and going. Everyone, everywhere, every day. Will you bow your heads and close your eyes? I'm gonna ask you the most important question that you'll ever be asked. Do you know Jesus? Do you know Jesus? We just shared the story about the woman on the well, at the, at the well that Jesus made an appointment with. And I believe he's made an appointment with you today. He doesn't want you to live one moment, one day without knowing him as your Lord and Savior. That you can have a relationship with him. The Bible says that that comes by believing in him and trusting him with our life here, but also trusting him with eternity. You may have heard this question before, but do you know if you were to breathe your last breath where you would spend eternity? You know, it's not about how good you live. It's not all about how how accomplishments that you make, how many accomplishments you make. It's about who you know and knowing Jesus and trusting him with your life. And the Bible says that he is the only way that we get to heaven. 
And maybe you have prayed a prayer like this before and you've asked Jesus to be the Lord of your life, but you would just say, Michael, I'm without this relationship with him. I just feel like God is not first in my life. And today I need a fresh start. And I just wanna to come to him again and recommit my life to him. Either one of those decisions, we're not gonna embarrass you or call you out. We're not gonna make you say anything or do anything. This is really a personal decision between you and the Lord, but I would just be honored to lead you in a prayer and committing your life to him. So with heads bowed and eyes closed, if that's you, would you just be so bold just to slip your hand up and say, Michael, that's me. Will you pray with me today? Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you. If you're watching online, you can participate in this. You can put something in the comment bar. You can DM us and just tell us, hey, I'm praying this prayer. Come into Jesus. Anybody else, just a few more seconds, you want to join these others today? You want to commit your life to Jesus for the first time or you want to come back home? You just need a fresh start. I'm gonna give you some words to pray and you just pray this with all of your heart. I just want you to picture him standing right there before you and you just pray this prayer from the bottom of your heart. It can sound like this. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for sending Jesus. Jesus, I believe you're real. I believe you came and you died on the cross and you beat on the cross, sin, death, hell, and the grave. And you, you paid the price for me to spend eternity with you because you rose from the grave. And today... Here's my life. I give it to you as an offering. I surrender to you and I ask you, would you come and be my personal savior and my friend? I believe that one day I'll see you face to face in a place called heaven. And I thank you that my life here is on mission. Today, I surrender my life to you to live for your purpose and what you've called me to. Thank you so much for loving me. Thank you for finding me today. In your name I pray, amen.